Son of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts be open, all desires are known, from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. May St. Catherine of Stenning pray Amen. for us. St. Wilfred of York pray Amen. for us. St. Richard of Chichester pray Amen. for us. St. Louina of Alfriston Pray for us, Our Lady Seat of Wisdom. Pray Amen. for us, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Well, good evening and welcome uh, once again to our uh, weekly Lent study. Uh, Ad Orientem, Conversi and Dominum. Turning to the East, turn to the Lord. Now, I'm going to begin with a, a little recap uh, from last week. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask any questions of those of you who were here. Um, but it may just help to, again, uh, sort of bring our thoughts back to where we left them last week. So we reflected last week particularly on the orientation of the temple and the arrangement of the temple. So you may remember that the temple was built east to west, that it faced east, so the entrance to the temple faced east toward the rising sun and toward Mount Olivet, where it was believed the Messiah would come. As you enter in the eastern gate, you would see before you a great altar, the altar of burnt sacrifice. Uh, here was... Uh, where the uh, animals uh, would be burnt in sacrifice. And to the right, or sorry, to your left, as you enter in the Eastern Gate, would be a big cistern of water, living water, known as the Molten Sea. And those living waters came to the temple via an um, uh, aqueduct system that Solomon had built all the way from Bethlehem, from the pools outside Bethlehem. Then, past the altar would be a huge portico with huge uh, golden doors, which when the temple was uh, open for business, as it were, uh, when the sacrifices were going on, those doors would be open, and there would hang a great blue veil or curtain. And that is as much as you would see. And then beyond there, we enter into the holy place, where was uh, found the presence bread and a table laid as if for a banquet, as if for a meal, literally with the divine. 
Then there would be another veil. Behind that veil was the uh, altar of incense, a big gold altar where incense was burnt. Uh, and then another veil, and behind that veil was the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies. And then we reflected on how churches in the traditional manner are built, of course, from west to east. So that if you were to put, uh, if you were to uh, imagine the Temple Mount uh, and the Temple being here, uh, the entrance to the temple facing east and going back that way. So a traditional church would be built almost in mirror, inverse fashion, going the other way. Remember that at Passover, the uh, sun rising in the east fell directly onto the eastern gate and the eastern front of the temple. And remember that it was at Passover that Christ was crucified and Golgotha was about here and he as the Lamb of God was being slain upon the altar of the cross on Calvary so the lambs, the Passover lambs were being sacrificed on the uh, great altar of burnt offering before uh, the eastern face of the temple. Now we reflected, we remember of course that the uh, temple is facing east because that is from whence the Messiah will come. So the Christian church begins at that point as it were and goes eastward. Again the other point being that when uh, the Israelites uh, were led from captivity in, uh, from slavery in Egypt they went east toward the land of Canaan to the promised land um, and the idea being that, and eventually of course ending up in Jerusalem, the idea being all the time that from east is where God's glory, where holiness and everything comes. So then in the Christian church, or the Christian temple, as you enter the west doors, as you look along the nave, you will see whether it's, uh, now remember this is a traditional church building, uh, so then you would see either an iconostasis uh, or a rood screen or a pulpitum, a stone screen. But above that, you would see a rood, which is an old medieval term for cross. And above that, above the screen, however it's made, you will see above it a large crucifix, a large depiction of the crucifixion, often with Our Lady and St. John on either side. Immediately, normally, uh, either directly in front of you or to the left or right of you will be a big uh, basin of water, a font, uh, and that of course representing uh, the living water of Christ within whom we are uh, baptised, uh, we die to the old self and we rise uh, anew in Christ. The cross, of course, then, if we think of our uh, uh, Jewish temple, first century Jewish, uh, sorry, first temple period temple, uh, the cross then, the rood, the screen, is representative of the altar of sacrifice. Obviously there, the connection being made of the Lamb of God being sacrificed for us. But also there, of course, uh, particularly in uh, Byzantine churches, you will see uh, the iconostasis underneath. Up until the Reformation in this country, you would have had a rude screen, as it was sometimes called, um, a wooden screen uh, with panels, painted panels of the saints. Likewise, the iconostasis also contains paintings, the pictures of uh, depictions of the saints. This representing, of course, uh, the beginning, the, the um, uh, the saints in light, the beginning of heaven. Uh, remember that at uh, our Lord's death, the veil in the temple was torn in two, as it were. So the separation of um, uh, uh, heaven and earth uh, is gone away. So here we have uh, the saints in light, those who have passed from darkness to light, those who have been reborn in the blood of the Lamb, they're uh, supporting, uh, as it were, the, the cross and the crucifixion. 
beyond the screen, then we go into the holy place where those uh, who have been uh, dedicated to God specifically for his service would sit traditionally. Uh, here in the medieval church, here would be the choir, uh, or the chancel, but here would be the choir. Uh, originally, of course, those, whether they were singing or whether they were serving at the altar or whatever, in old times, would have been made clerics, uh, the uh, minor order, or the, the least uh, sign, as it were, of being uh, dedicated to God for God's service in that way, was the tonsure, as we see here. Um, and that is the, the tonsure is the first step normally as it were the first rung of the minor orders leading up to the major orders towards uh, through ordination uh, towards eventually the high priesthood and the bishop so this holy place here of course uh, is as it were representing uh, the angelic choir so now if we think of the temple and the way it's orientated, and then if we think of the church and the way it's orientated, and then we think of heaven as it were, and the heavenly temple above, um, this, the three as it were are uh, in alignment. So in the divine liturgy, uh, in the formal worship of the church, uh, the uh, choir uh, becomes literally the angelic choir, and the angelic choir literally becomes uh, joins their voices or we join our voices uh, with them. This of course emphasised particularly at the Sanctus, the Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Um, uh, that's the, the idea of or the purpose or what happens with divine liturgy um, is that it's not just the worship of us, it's not just the worship of earth, but it is the worship of earth joined uh, with the worship of heaven or joining in with the worship of heaven. Also, traditionally, uh, this place, um, you will find a lectern or an ambo where uh, the word of God uh, is, is proclaimed and read or sung, uh, signifying, of course, uh, bread, heavenly manna too. Uh, remember that in the holy place in the temple, here was the table with the uh, presence bread. At the end of the uh, choir, then you have the beginning of the sanctuary. Above the sanctuary you have uh, a ciborium uh, sometimes, uh, a great big sort of um, uh, domed arch, almost tent-like structure uh, above the altar. Here I'm particularly thinking of, say, um, a, a Romanesque basilica of the third or fourth centuries. Um, uh, they're representing, as it were, uh, the tabernacle, the tent uh, that the Israelites uh, had for uh, the Ark of the Covenant when they were in the wilderness. Underneath that, of course, is the altar. The altar and the Ark of the Covenant becoming one as in, one as in, one at the same. Sorry, one and the same thing, as it were. Of course, on the altar you have the tabernacle, and in, contained in the tabernacle, just as was contained in the Ark of the Covenant, is the manna. In the Ark of the Covenant, it was that manna that dropped from the skies given to the Israelites to feed them in the wilderness. Uh, now it is the new manna uh, from heaven, the bread of life, uh, Christ himself, who said, I am the bread of life. So, hold, try and hold, as it were, <laughs> all, those, all those different concepts and thoughts. As we begin... To develop further our understanding of uh, the liturgy, of the divine liturgy particularly. So we recognised last week that there was an obvious, an obvious correlation between uh, the Passover sacrifice of the lambs, uh, the sacrifice of Christ as the Lamb of God upon the cross, um, and of uh, the altar and everything else. And the significance of course with Passover as well was the the rising sun falling directly uh, from the east. It was, it's, 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 it's as if, I mean, before even there was the concept really of north, uh, south, east and west as, as we sort of have it today in the sense of, um, uh, in, in quite uh, a sort of precise way. Strangely enough, the temple itself, the first temple was true magnetic east in the 
where it was facing. Um, and that, of course, is significant for us because uh, we worship facing toward the east and uh, the Messiah, the second coming of the Messiah, uh, again, is uh, thought of uh, with allegories and allusions uh, to the rising sun, to the dawn, etc. But in the Divine Liturgy, too, is not just the concept of the Passover, but also, too, of the Day of Atonement. Now, the Day of Atonement, uh, known in Hebrew as Yom Kippur, uh, a very important um, uh, festival uh, for uh, the Jews, and it signified uh, various things, all of which were kind of wrapped up uh, with the orientation and uh, um, the way things were, were placed in the temple. But of course, atonement for us uh, has great significance as well, because of course we refer to Christ's uh, sacrifice upon the cross as an atonement, an atoning for our sins. Atoning means, as it were, to um, seek forgiveness or indeed make restitution. Now for the Jews on Yom Kippur, there was the blood sacrifice. In fact, there were uh, three sacrifices that would take place. Um, two of them would be blood sacrifices. The first would be the sacrifice of a bull. And the blood from the bull uh, would be used by the high priest uh, to sprinkle uh, and cleanse the temple and its precincts as a uh, offering <coughs> in, a, in, in, <coughs> in restitution and atonement for the sins of the priests and the sins of the priest's household and for any sins that were committed perhaps in the temple precincts. Then there would be used two goats. The first goat would be named for the Lord, um, for Adonai. And it would be sacrificed and uh, its blood uh, would be used by the high priest uh, to, be, to sprinkle in, in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, particularly in the Ark of the Covenant. And this was the sin offering, as it were. This was the blood sacrifice and atonement for sins of everyone. Now, the important thing here to know, perhaps, is that the high priest, it was only the high priest who could enter the Holy of Holies. None of the other priests did. They might go as far as the holy place where the showbread was, but otherwise, um, uh, that was it. Only the high priest would go through into the Holy of Holies. And the high priest uh, was uh, required to wear uh, particular clothing. Indeed, of course, the priests of the temple were as well. Uh, all of this uh, is recorded in the Old Testament. Um, and the uh, high priest would wear, uh, first of all, a white tunic. Now, white tunics, of course, representative of purity, uh, we, of course, ourselves have white tunics. Uh, priests wear albs. Alb, of course, comes from uh, the Latin word for white, uh, for albus. Uh, and uh, uh, so that uh, is a direct correlation there as that uh, first garment. So the idea, of course, is, uh, as always, that before a sacrifice is made, one is ritually clean. Uh, and so the alb or the white tunic is representative of the ritual cleansing that has occurred in order to make the priest worthy to enter into uh, or to offer a sacrifice. So the high priest wears a white tunic. Then he wears a, a garment um, known as the echad, uh, a blue sort of tunical uh, with uh, scarlet or red and green and gold, uh, um, cloth uh, or coloured strands uh, interwoven within it and around the hem of it are alternating uh, pomegranates uh, and 
bells. Now, not the real actual fruit of the pomegranate, uh, but an artistic uh, a depiction of it, representation of it in gold, but literally bells uh, were worn. Now this is rather like the uh, vestment called the sakos uh, that Byzantine bishops wear. So it's a, a tunicle uh, and literally uh, on the hem uh, of the garment uh, are bells. And it is said that the bells uh, were uh, did, had served various purposes. Uh, in one place it is sort of suggested that when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, the bells uh, signified his presence to God. So signified the fact that the priest was coming in. So that um, if, if God was perhaps in repose, uh, then the bells of the priest would, would wake him, would stir him. Uh, similarly too, for the priests outside of the Holy of Holies, uh, hearing the bells was a comfort and a consolation to them to know that the high priest hadn't died. Because uh, uh, there was, of course, a concern, uh, a belief that you know, if you entered into the presence of God, the, the presence of God would be so awesome uh, that you, know, you would die on the spot, as it were. So uh, the bells sounding said to the people, to the priests outside, on the other side of the uh, veil of the Holy of Holies, that the high priest was still alive, so things must be good, things must be okay, God has not struck him dead. And that's an important thing to them, because the high priest was representing all of Israel. The ephod was, uh, had two fastenings of onyx stone, and on the onyx were carved... Uh, the 12 uh, tribes of Israel, or the names of the sons, the 12 sons of Israel, Jacob, of course, Joseph's father. Um, on the right shoulder, the six oldest uh, sons, and on uh, the uh, left shoulder, the six youngest sons. So the high priest represented the nation of Israel. He represented the chosen people of God. So if something awful happened to him, that would be a really bad sign for everybody else. If God had struck the representative of Israel down, uh, then God was not, not amused, clearly. Um, another thing to note is that what separated, aside from the uh, ephod and the breastplate, uh, which contained 12 stones, uh, gemstones, each one uh, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, the high priest also wore uh, uh, a head covering. Um, uh, nobody's quite sure now, of course, what it looked like, but perhaps something sort of turban-esque, uh, we might think. And uh, he was signed on his forehead uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with a tau. Now that's uh, spelled T-A-U. Uh, and it's a Hebrew letter. And it's the last letter of the Hebrew word Emet, which means truth, which is spelt with three uh, letters, Aleph, Mem, and Tau. Uh, so, and that is written in ancient Hebrew, not, by the way, in modern Hebrew, but in ancient Hebrew is written like a cross. It's written like a cross. So the high priest is marked with the sign of the cross. It's an, uh, anointed with oil. Uh, and he enters into the Holy of Holies uh, and, and sprinkles uh, the atoning uh, blood sacrifice on the Ark of the Covenant. Then he would come out uh, from there and continue to sprinkle the rest of the temple and the rest of the temple precincts. Then the second goat, and this is where we get the phrase, of course, scapegoat. The second goat... Uh, the high priest would pray, uh, he'd lay his hands literally on the head of the goat uh, and pray and literally, uh, well not literally, but figuratively uh, transfer all the sins of Israel onto the goat. So he would literally put his hands on the goat's head and pray basically that all the sins of Israel uh, would be taken by this goat. And then this poor goat uh, basically would be led out, 
with a scarlet cord or a scarlet rope uh, and it would be uh, sent off uh, into the wilderness. And uh, there is a legend, uh, there was a legend that, that suggested that as the goat went off into the wilderness, so that scarlet rope turned white, as if to signify uh, the sins uh, were being forgiven. Interestingly, in the uh, 40 years prior to AD 70, uh, when the uh, temple, the second temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, uh, in those preceding 40 years, uh, it was observed that the scarlet rope never turned white. Interesting. Um, so, Day of Atonement then was a supremely important day uh, for the Jews because it was about the forgiveness of sins. Interestingly, again, it was the only time that a fast was prescribed. How many days? 40 days. A 40 day fast uh, was prescribed in preparation uh, leading up uh, to the Atonement. Now, the other important thing or significant thing about atonement, particularly about atonement within the temple, was that the temple uh, uh, was uh, believed to represent creation. Was believed to represent creation. And various uh, parts of the temple, the veil before the Ark of the Covenant and stuff, uh, represented different days, the seven days of creation. Uh, uh, so, for example, the veil between uh, the Holy of Holies uh, and, the, uh, and the altar of incense, uh, that represented day two, the distinction between night and day, um, and so on. So various parts, various ornaments within the temple represented uh, days of creation. And it was believed that the whole point of the atoning sacrifice uh, on atonement, on the Day of Atonement, uh, was uh, literally to renew creation. To renew creation, as it were to restore creation. Um, such was the power of the forgiveness of sins uh, that was promised by the covenant between God and the Israelites that on that Day of Atonement Literally, everything was wiped clean. Everything was kind of started again. Now, of course, there are, I hope you've drawn the parallels to Christ. Of course, Christ as the sacrificial lamb. But more here now, Christ as the high priest. Christ the high priest himself who is described in the letter to the Hebrews as being our great high priest who has passed into the heavens, but who now no more has to offer a twofold sacrifice. So whereas the old high priest performed the first sacrifice, blood sacrifice, to cleanse himself and the priests uh, and the temple, our Lord, of course, was being, being pure himself, being sinless himself, uh, had no need to offer a twofold sacrifice. He only offers uh, the one sacrifice of himself. And that one sacrifice, whereas uh, atonement was annual, uh, the atoning sacrifice of Christ, of course, is eternal uh, for, for, for eternity. Replacing, as it were, or rather than replacing, fulfilling the covenant previously. So, whereas the Day of Atonement, covenantal sacrifice, was uh, meant to sort of start again the perpetual nature of the covenant between God and his chosen people, uh, with Christ, when he offered himself, he offered himself once and once for all. After that point, there was no need 
no need for any more of further sacrifices. So perfect an offering is Christ. But also too, of course, then, in Christ have all things been restored, have all things been perfected. That is to say that the work of restoration, the work of what will come at the end of time, has begun in, through and with Christ. So that St Paul says, of course, that all things have been restored in Christ. Now, in the early church, of course, this was uh, significant, particularly because um, they had uh, high expectations of the second coming, of the return of the Messiah, being sooner rather than later. So the idea of parousia, which is basically the end times and the second coming, um, was, had particular significance uh, for the early church. But still does, of course, for us too uh, in the liturgy. We know that however and whenever the Lord returns, uh, we know the parousia will happen, we know the resurrection of the dead will happen, we know that the new heaven and the new earth will be created, we know that the new Jerusalem will be established uh, in the kingdom of God, uh, and we know that all things will be restored. We know that uh, the kingdom of God that is promised, the paradise to come, uh, will be the perfection and the fulfilment of all that had gone before, and indeed will be the restoration of what originally had been intended by, intended by God at the beginning of time, of which for us, of course, means from the Garden of Eden before the fall. And so for us as uh, Christians, uh, today, for ourselves, the Divine Liturgy is, as I've said before, always speaking to both the past, the present and the future. The idea being that uh, in the Divine Liturgy we are transported, we might say, uh, to uh, the cross, really, we're transported to the foot of the cross as that central moment in time, as that, uh, what's, what's the word, centra uh, fugal, I suppose, uh, moment in time, that all things come to and from that moment that have significance. And so we believe, of course, in the Divine Liturgy about uh, the sacrifice that occurs on the altar is not a, a repetition but a representation of that one and only sacrifice offered by Christ Himself uh, for our redemption. So you may recall that at the Reformation, the Protestants were trying to suggest that um, the Catholics believed that uh, Christ died again and again and again at every mass. I mean that was it was a, it was an absolute lie. Uh, that was there was never the belief, never been the, been the belief of the church, uh, but rather that uh, it is one and the same sacrifice of Calvary that we witness and that we share in the worship of, in adoration, and which we receive. Uh, now, I'm going to draw things to a close soon because I want to speak more about presence bread or the show bread and uh, the bread of uh, the Eucharist uh, next week. Uh, I don't want to give it away all too soon. Uh, but significantly for us, and particularly as we're preparing to celebrate Holy Week, one of the wonderful things about uh, Holy Week is that the liturgy is expressly uh, designed uh, to enable us to realise this representation. In many ways, we, it's better to understand or to conceive of the Divine Liturgy of Holy Week as being one big service. Although we experience it on different days of the week, and we experience it in different, slightly different forms, each of those forms is only really emphasising uh, an aspect 
of, of the liturgy. So uh, the Holy Week liturgy is particularly of the Sacrum Triduum of the great three days of Monday, Thursday, Good Friday and Holy Saturday um, are really sort of the Divine Liturgy or the Mass kind of spread out or eked out. And we certainly feel that on Holy Saturday uh, when it's at least a, about the three, a three and a half hour uh, liturgy um, and where we experience going from darkness to light, where we experience uh, uh, the testimony of the prophets, we hear the history, the whole history of salvation from Adam onwards uh, before celebrating the, uh, the first uh, joy of uh, Pascha uh, and the resurrection. But then, of course, conversely too, every Mass is itself a representation of those events. So every Mass, whether it be a short, uh, uh, said, low Mass, uh, contains within it everything that is contained within Holy Week. And everything that is contained within the Holy Week liturgies is, are themselves contained in a representation of everything that happened in the first Holy Week and everything, of course, that went on through history. So, often, uh, so it's the best way to understand uh, the Divine Liturgy is this concept of past, present and future. Past, in the sense that uh, we are experiencing uh, in the representation of uh, events, the salvation uh, events of our history that have gone before, so uh, the institution of the Lord's Supper on Monday Thursday, the crucifixion on Good Friday, the ultimate atoning sacrifice uh, of the Paschal Lamb, uh, and uh, we receive uh, the new presence bread, as it were, the new manna from heaven, and we experience all this through the power of the uh, resurrection. Every Mass contains all of that. Every divine liturgy, every Eucharist uh, contains all of that. And that's the past. But of course that's all made present. So we experience it in the here and now. We experience it in the present, even though we are, what we are experiencing is, as it were, of the past. And yet, and at the same time, it all too speaks to the future. It all speaks to the completion of the kingdom and when the Messiah returns. So we are experiencing, particularly in the moment of, the, the holiest moment of the Divine Liturgy, the Eucharistic prayer, or uh, the canon of the Mass, uh, when we have joined in with the song of the angels, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, uh, when Christ himself is then as our High Priest, offering himself that perfect one, uh, complete oblation and satisfaction and atonement, uh, for the sins of the world begins then to the moment of restoration, the reconciliation of the world with God. We are, as it were, glimpsing the future restoration that will be. And I suppose the easiest way, perhaps, uh, to try and understand it is, is, to, is to appreciate God's timelessness. To appreciate God's timelessness. To remember that we, of course, uh, being only mortal, can only experience things in a chronological way. And yet such is the cosmic significance of these events, though that of these, to us now, historical events, but they have such a cosmic nature to them that they uh, transverse, they transcend our sense of time. Um, I don't know if that helps, but that's, <laughs> um, <laughs> I suppose, but, but really, I mean, you may recall last week when we were referring to the Holy of Holies uh, in the temple, it, it was, it, it, there was, there was a concept uh, that the, the, the Jews had that it was, that that space was, uh, almost primordial or, or, or 
you know, that, or, or even or more than that. It's so mysterious um, uh, that you know even gravity was supposed to be defied in that place. Um, it was something so mysterious, so awesome, and because I suppose because it is the you know represented and was supposed to be the very presence of God uh, uh, dwelling there on earth, as it were. Um, but in like fashion then with the Divine Liturgy, it too takes us to that place, as it were. And this is why uh, the first talk, when we talked about active participation in the Liturgy, being about, uh, not about uh, all of us, uh, doing something. So remember that little gear uh, means uh, work of the people but meaning on behalf of the people. Um, so it is, uh, liturgy is, is formal worship offered to God by those whom he has anointed, elected, set apart, consecrated, blessed specifically for that purpose and they do that on behalf of uh, the faithful, on behalf of the people. So the way in which we actively participate ourselves, who are not, as it were, directly involved, so if we're not ministering at the altar, if we're not uh, uh, one of the sacred ministers, if we're not a server, uh, if we're not in the choir, uh, is to spiritually participate with our hearts, but our whole being too. Indeed, the purpose is that we should fulfil the first of the great commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Uh, and it's, that's why um, vestments are so colourful, that's why incense is used, that's why uh, music is used, that's why um, magnificent artistry is used and, and craftsmanship uh, is employed in, in, in decorating the holy places and in offering the divine liturgy, literally to enable all the senses to fulfill that first commandment so that incense of course we both appeals to our eyes um, and, and also to our noses we may not always appreciate uh, uh, it's, you know somewhat subjective sometimes but um, the appreciation of incense but nonetheless incense is there to to harness and, and draw attention as it were, to our senses. Similarly, music uh, and the sound of the bells and everything, uh, that too is to, to harness and arrest the attention of our ears. Uh, the colour of the vestments, uh, the movement of the sacred ministers, etc., to arrest the eyes, um, so that the whole of us is engaged in worship, so that our whole being is engaged in, in the act of worship, so that we are fulfilling then the purpose of worship, which is to manifest our love for God, to express our love for God. And at the same time as all of that, of course, is going on, our hearts and our minds uh, are to be directed and to follow the sense and purpose of the worship uh, that we are seeing uh, offered on our behalf by the sacred ministers. So all these things are there to appeal to our senses, uh, essentially to keep us focused, to try and stop our, our minds and our hearts from wandering elsewhere. Remember in Mass today, uh, uh, the sense of the, uh, of the readings uh, was uh, Christ saying about, you know, it's all about the heart. And what you think in your heart counts, it matters. If you think evil things, evil things you will do. If you think good things, if you think perfect things, if you think righteous things, you're more likely to do those. You know, remember our Lord elsewhere says, where your heart is, there is your treasure also. So if, if, if we're not completely, if we're not focused and engaged on the right thing, uh, if we can, and we can so easily be distracted, we can so easily be distracted. The purpose of holy hour um, that, that we we went through before before this talk. Again, um, 
the candles and the, and the light and, and, and everything and, and, and the sound, the music and all that uh, is all designed to arrest, as it were, our attention, to, to remind us to focus on why we're there. But you can all too easily, after a few minutes, if you don't fall asleep, um, you know, start thinking about your shopping list for tomorrow or what you've got on in the week or whatever. Sometimes in the offering of your life to God in prayer, so, you know, you've got a particular concern or worry, you're anxious perhaps about something, you're thinking about something and you're initially, you're praying to God about it. And then, but if, you're, if, but if you don't concentrate, uh, your mind can begin to, to wander off. Uh, and you suddenly realise, oh, oh, <laughs> sorry, I was supposed to be telling you about that. <laughs> not, not going off, uh, getting lost in my own mind. Um, and that's the beauty of, of formal liturgy, as it were, is because it does try to arrest and engage the whole being um, so that all our energy, all our focus, all our attention is directed toward God. And, then, and that moment we are fulfilling um, uh, the first commandment. And of course, the second, uh, as it were, purpose of liturgy is that having then been in the presence of God, having then experienced the presence, presence of God, having been touched by the presence of God, which is what communion is all about, that then we, of course, can go out and manifest God's love and share our experience with others uh, so that they, so that others too, uh, may come to experience uh, the wonderment and, and the love uh, that we find in the liturgy for God uh, for themselves. So next week, um, uh, I know one of you is not here next week because they'll be in Greece. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, uh, next week we will um, go on to the uh, showbread. So the what was called the presence bread in the holy place in the temple. Uh, and obviously the direct correlation between it and the Eucharist uh, and, and how that's brought about. Um, but there we are. So we'll just finish in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Heavenly Father, we commend to you our thoughts and our discussion, our, del our deliberation, our contemplation of your holy things. May indeed what, uh, as we try to deepen our understanding and appreciation of that formal worship designed to enable us to truly and honourably worship you, uh, may these thoughts and what we have learnt uh, shape our own prayers, our own forms of private devotion to you, that likewise our whole beings may be arrested in attention toward you that we may truly feel the benefit of our interaction with you, of our prayer with you, of our conversations with you, and that through doing so, we may know and avail ourselves of your loving grace that can effect true change and conversion of life within ourselves, but also too, we pray, through us toward others, that others may come to know of your love, and that we may be true icons of your love and presence in our world. We ask this through the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.